All right, all right. Red Nation, today we're going to be talking about scatter in x-ray imaging and the factors that affect scatter, as well as how grids work to reduce scatter coming up here at How Radiology Works. We've had separate videos on the factors that affect scatter in the past, but here we're just going to put it all together. You can get all the information in one spot of the different factors that affect scatter in your x-ray imaging. To start off, we're going to walk through this table right here. Line by line, we're going to go through the different areas of the physical effects. We're going to go through the different technical parameters in order to identify which ones impact the scatter. Also, we want to know the directionality. Namely, if we increase a given parameter, Will that lead to an increase of scatter or will that lead to a decrease of scatter? First off, let's talk about the KVP, the kilovolt potential. The energy of your x-ray beam is largely determined by the KVP. We've talked about this before. You have a spectrum, but if we think about just the average energy in KEV of the x-rays that are coming in, they're going to then interact with the patient some via photoelectric and some via Compton. We've talked about this before, but photoelectric is dominant at lower energies. The lower the energy, the more photoelectric is going to be playing a part. And then the higher the energy, the more Compton is playing a part. If you go to higher KVP, it's higher energy and thus more scatter. Compton interactions are going to be taking place more often than photoelectric at the higher energies and at the very low energies photoelectric are going to be taking place more from the perspective of scatter we'd like to reduce the kvp then let's talk about patient size habitus essentially the larger the patient is the more chances that you're going to have interaction the more chances that you're going to have an interaction of your x-rays via scatter. Again, just a simple diagram. If you have a given patient thickness shown here, and this is just showing one interaction, and then if you have a thicker area, there's more chances for those x-rays to actually interact via scatter. You're going to get more scatter measured on your detector if the patient is thicker, if you're crossing through more tissue. Then next we can talk about what we call the field of view or the collimation. If you collimate down, you have a smaller field of view. If you have a wider field of view, you're doing less collimation. If you think about this first scenario where you're radiating this region here, and then you're going to have the possibility for this cross scatter. As you go to a wider field of view, again, the measurement is actually happening over here. The image receptor would be over here. And because your field of view is larger, now there's the chance for more scatter to interact within the patient and be measured at the image receptor. As your field of view increases, your scatter increases as well. Next factor we wanna talk about is the object to image distance. This is your object where the x-rays are coming in. They're going to interact in your object. They're going to be then measured on the plane of your image receptor. And this is kind of our baseline scenario. You can think of the fact that there's a possibility for x-rays to scatter here and then be measured on your image receptor. If you move the image receptor further away from the patient, increase your object to image distance or your OID. There is going to be the chance then that some of the scattered x-rays, they will actually scatter and not be measured on your image receptor because they will be coming off at an angle, whereas the primaries will still be measured on your image receptor. A larger OID is going to lead to less scatter. In our spatial resolution video, you heard that we want to minimize that OID in order to minimize the blur due to the focal spot. There's always going to be trade-offs here, but just keep in mind, this is one area where you can actually reduce scatter by increasing the OID.
if we come back to our table here, we can see, like we talked about, KVP, as we increase the KVP, we are going to increase the amount of scatter. Body habitus, as you increase the thickness of the patient, the amount of material that's there, you're going to increase the scatter. Air gap, if you add more of an air gap or increase that OID, you are going to decrease the scatter. Field of view, if you increase the field of view, you are going to increase the scatter because you have more area for those x-rays to potentially scatter. Then just be ready if there's questions on the amount of time or the MA or patient motion, those things in general have a negligible impact on the amount of scatter that's in the image. One thing that we can do is actually introduce attenuator that's going to go in between your object and your image receptor and that's going to be targeted at preferentially blocking the scatter. The x-rays in the case that you're... Here's an example of a grid. In this case it's a parallel grid. These are the septa. The x-rays will be absorbed by these septa if they're coming in at an angle and the x-rays if they're coming straight down and just pass straight through they will not be absorbed it is possible however that some of the x-rays which are the primary x-rays can actually become absorbed by this grid as well that is one downside of using a grid is that you do end up actually reducing some of the primary that's actually making it to the image receptor but if you can reduce a higher fraction of the scatter, then you can improve the ability to visualize structures because you can reduce this scatter fraction. And this scatter in general in our images, as we've talked about before, leads to an overall background haze in the image. We call these septa. We can talk about the height of the septa here, H. D is the distance between the septa. And then T here is the thing. We talk about what we call the grid ratio, which is the ratio of the height divided by the distance between the septa. And then we can also talk about the grid frequency or how often that grid is going to repeat itself. So it will repeat itself basically one divided by, and then it's D plus T. So both the gap between the septa and the septa size themselves, that's how often that grid is going to repeat itself. What I drew there was a side view of a 1D grid. It's also possible to have 2D grids. This is actually a top-down view now, looking like you're from the x-ray source. And then this 2D grid has septa in both directions. and this 2D grid is particularly beneficial for what's called biplane imagers, where you have actually x-rays can be coming from two different, often roughly orthogonal views, such that you're taking x-ray and getting real-time x-ray images of orthogonal angles, especially for neuro interventions, for instance. In this case, the 2D grid can help preferentially reduce cross scatter that's going to come from the other x-ray tube on these biplane systems. We can also have an effect called grid cutoff. If you zoom way in on that grid that I was just drawing and you have your x-ray source, your x-rays are coming from here, the primary x-rays are going to be making it down right here. And then especially if you're off kind of to the side at an angle, you can think about what we call grid cutoff, where the x-rays that are coming down at this angle actually are not going to be measured on the image receptor because they're going to be blocked primarily by the grid. Grid cutoff is more of an issue when you have a parallel, namely a non-focused grid like I've shown far, and especially when you're off at an angle then actually the height here of the grid starts to really play an impact as far as the 
kind of solid angle that is being blocked here by the grid septa. We can quantify that by what we call the grid cutoff ratio, which is the SID divided by the grid ratio. We can quantify that by what we call the cutoff distance, which is the SID divided by the grid ratio. In order to avoid this type of scenario though, where you're having those septa actually cut off some of the x-rays off at an angle, what you would actually like to do is have a focused grid. We know that our primary beam is what we call divergent, right? The x-rays spread out. They come out in a cone type shape from the x-ray tube itself. And the size of that cone is given by the collimation that you're gonna use. And since the x-rays are coming out in this spreading out divergent manner, you would actually like to have a focus grid where the grid septa are pointed at the focal spot. If the grid septa are pointed at the focal spot, then you will not have grid cutoff because even out here at an angle, those x-rays are gonna be coming through and they'll be basically coming in parallel to these septa. This helps to reduce the amount of primary that's blocked by the x-ray grid. One thing to consider here though, is this angle. Again, we wanna be pointing right at the focal spot. If you bring, if you take this same focus grid, which is designed to be used at this distance, from the source to the imager and you move it much closer, you're actually gonna have a problem because the direction of those x-rays is gonna be different. And this is why it's important to have focus grids be used only in a certain range of distance from your source to the image receptor, such that those x-rays are gonna be parallel to the septa. Now let's talk about how we can quantify the improvement that's happening. Because we're blocking scatter, that background haze is gonna be reduced in our images, and thus that background haze is actually reducing the contrast in our X-ray image. We have an improvement factor, which is the improvement in the contrast that we can achieve. We call that K. K is just the image contrast with the grid, divided by the image contrast without the grid. You'd like K to be a number which is greater than one, showing that you're improving the contrast in your images because of the use of the grid. Typically in X-ray imaging, your K is gonna be on the order of two, you know, from one and a half to two and a half. So your contrast is actually going up by about a factor of two, these are things that you can measure on your system by doing controlled experiments. Like we've talked about though, there is no free lunch in X-ray imaging. And because we are blocking some of those primary rays, the use of a grid actually does require additional radiation in order to have the same noise or the same intensity on the image receptor, which will lead to the same noise in the image. We call that the Bucky factor or B. And what that factor is, is basically the intensity on your image receptor of x-rays with the grid divided by the intensity without the grid. This is also gonna be proportional to the dose because in order to maintain the same intensity on the image receptor, typically the dose will be increased to the patient. Again, this Bucky factor is typically proportional to the dose with the grid divided by the dose without the grid. On your system, what you have to do if you're controlling the parameters manually, you have to increase the MAS by the Bucky factor. And here are some approximate grid ratios. Again, the grid ratio actually will depend on KVP as well, namely the spectra. But if you're asked a question, these are some numbers you wanna commit to memory for your exam. 
that you know the approximate factors. Again, the default is if you have no grid, your Bucky factor is one. There's no impact. If you have a five to one grid, the Bucky factor is about two. Eight to one grid, the Bucky factor is about four. 12 to one grid, the Bucky factor is about five. And 16 to one grid, the Bucky factor is about six. These are the Bucky factors are a little bit less than one half of the grid ratio. But just in general, try and remember this table such that if you get a question that's asking about how you want to compensate your technical parameters because you've introduced a Bucky factor, you can actually pull these numbers from memory for your exam. You now know all the gory details about grids, namely your what we call post-patient collimator. It's actually stopping some of the x-rays that are going from the object onto the image receptor. But make sure you understand all the details about the actual collimator on the tube side as well, such that you can understand the full flow of x-rays coming from the tube through the collimator, through the patient, and through the grid onto your image receptor. Coming up next here at Howard Yale Yorks.